Hey, it's Dr. Crone again. Welcome to our video on party systems. It's the first in a series of two videos in our parties and interest groups unit. I'm sure all of you have some idea of what a political party is and what it does. I like this particular definition and I've highlighted the words that I think are important in it. This is an, a political party is an ongoing coalition. In other words, it's a group that, um, that is, isn't just singular. It's a coalition of interests joined together to try to get their candidates for public office elected under a common label. Parties have the goal of winning and the way that they do that is by getting candidates who support that party elected. In comparative politics, scholars have noted three different types of political parties across different countries and across history. Um, so I'm going to go through each one. Uh, the first type of party is an elite party. And these are usually the first parties in a country, and particularly these are mostly historical examples. There aren't a whole lot of elite parties left um, in, in the world and certainly not in democracies. But um, if you think of the founding of the United States, for example, or the original development of parties in Britain, um, these parties were not necessarily mass parties. They were not, they did not necessarily try to appeal to voters. Rather, they were groups of politicians who shared common beliefs um, and sort of shared a common enemy of the other people. And so um, elite parties come up uh, or are created usually within legislatures by groups of politicians who will work together to achieve common goals and they will compromise with each other against the other party. Um, so these are, um, they don't really exist too much anymore, especially in democracies. The second type of party is called a mass party. And this has been incredibly important in global history, not as much in democracies as in, um, countries that have experienced revolution. Um, so a mass party is a party that is strongly ideological. Um, we think of the communist parties or the fascist parties as being mass parties. These are parties that adhere to a strong ideology, um, usually a new or unusual ideology that hasn't been seen in that country before. Uh, they get their power through um, just enormous ability to mobilize citizens and the members of that party are true believers. They're not just consumers who sort of try to decide which party they like better. This, these are people who are dedicated to a, a, an extreme cause. Um, so we don't really have mass parties. We never really have had mass parties in the United States. Um, think of uh, the Soviet Union and China in their um, sort of authoritarian heyday. Uh, had mass parties, uh, certainly the Nazi party in, um, in uh, Nazi Germany would have been considered a mass party. Um, and this was really the development of political parties that actually worked hard to mobilize tons and tons of citizens, and they had a big effect on global history. Today, what most parties are in democracies are catch-all parties. And catch-all parties are less ideological than a mass party. Certainly they do take ideological stands. They might be known for being liberal or conservative. Um, and they do mobilize citizens for sure. But what they really focus on is the goal of winning. And they win by putting together coalitions of voters who are willing to vote for them. Um, they sort of have to woo their voters. They don't have um, uh, people who are, you know, sort of paying um, I die for you kind of members. Um, the members are said to identify with a party. Some identify very strongly, uh, but they are not necessarily the, the true strong ideologues of a mass party. Um, we call these big tent parties or catch all parties because a lot of times they're willing to change their positions on issues or uh, modify their issues uh, if they think they can appeal to a bigger tent of voters. So the catch all party is really what we call an opportunistic political actor. And that means that it has one single goal. And in this case, the party's goal is to win and to control government. 
and they're willing to change their ideology or change their position in order to win whatever it takes to increase their votes. Um, so an example of that would be the British Conservative Party, um, which could read the tea leaves after the Brexit referendum and say, you know, the, the Conservative Party opposed Brexit um, other than kind of a small wing of it. Uh, but in order to win and control the government as they are doing now, they had to embrace Brexit. Um, we can see in the US, the Republican Party has uh, shifted enormously under the Trump uh, leadership to represent um, uh, trade protectionism rather than globalization, um, which the uh, Republican Party had always uh, um, supported in the past. Um, and, and in order to understand this, uh, I know that idea of parties being flexible with their ideology is counterintuitive, um, especially for those of you that love politics and follow the news all the time. Um, in the short term, we tend to associate parties with very strongly with their ideologies, with uh, the Republican Party in the United States being very conservative and the Democratic Party being liberal. Um, but those are subject to change according to this understanding of uh, political parties as being opportunistic. Um, and a political scientist named Anthony Downs in the 1950s gave us a, an economic model for understanding how and why a party would alter its ideological message. Um, and this is called rational choice theory because it's based on the idea that both political parties and voters are rational actors in the political world. Um, they're out there trying to maximize their own utility, as economists would say, by making rational choices in their own self-interest. So Downs' theory rests on three important assumptions. So the assumptions are that both voters and the catch-all parties and democracies are rational actors. Um, they are opportunistic, so they want to win. Parties want to win, and they want to control legislative outcomes. And the third assumption is that rational voters are gonna vote for the parties that are closest to them on ideology, that that's how a rational voter would make a choice, is which party best represents my personal political beliefs. And if you logically sort of bind those three assumptions together, Downs tells us we come up with the conclusion that parties are gonna position themselves on an ideological spectrum where they think they can win the most votes. So this is kind of a uh, visual model of Downs' theory applied to a system where there are two parties. So we're gonna, this is a single member district winner take all system with two main political parties. Downs was a, an American, so he's mostly thinking about the American system here, but it applies to other countries as well. Um, and in this case, this particular version of his model uh, makes adds the important assumption that most voters are moderates um, and that we can actually show their distribution along a normal curve. So the normal curve just means that the most of the voters are right in the middle. Um, and I have that marked as that's what uh, Downs called the median voter. Um, median meaning right in the middle of the continuum. I like to give him a name and call him Fred. Um, so Fred here represents uh, the, the middle of the ideological uh, continuum and, and most people are just like Fred in their political beliefs. So if we have a system like that, what Downs would say is that in order for parties to win, they're gonna have to modify their ideological positions so they're pretty close to the center. They can't be exactly at the center. Um, but they're gonna try to moderate to gain the most votes they possibly can. So the Liberal Party will stay to the Liberal side of the median, but not very far. And same with the Conservative Party. Um, and this is gonna lead to political outcomes where the par parties are pretty moderate and they, it may even be hard to tell them apart. And the parties are gonna emphasize that cooperation with the other party is okay. So in a legislature with a normal distribution like this of voters, you're gonna get um, consensus building, you're gonna get um, uh, you know, super majority decisions with, with the majority from both parties agreeing. Um, and actually that's what the United States had for a very, very long time. And um, certainly Downs' theory applied to the United States up through about the 1980s or so. Um, in fact, in the 70s, the biggest complaint about the political parties was there's not a dime's worth of difference between them. They're, they're hard to tell apart on their ideology. 
So today we probably have a, an idea in the United States that that's not true and that that wouldn't be true in all countries either. Um, and Downs ha we can extend Downs' thinking to um, maybe questioning the assumption that most voters are moderate. So if we assume that, or if we throw that, that assumption out and say maybe most voters are not moderate or centrist, and then we'd have a different logic because um, it wouldn't be in their best, the party's best interest to be right in the center. So if we had a what's called a bimodal distribution where um, the, uh, the modes, instead of being one mode, which is the center of the distribution, or which is the most cases, the mode is the most cases, um, uh, with the previous normal curve we looked at on the previous slide, the median and the mode were exactly the same. The mode was right in the middle. But modes are not always in the middle of a distribution if we don't have a normal curve. Um, and here we have a bimodal distribution, which means there's two modes, uh, a sort of a liberal mode and a conservative mode. And here, rational choice says that parties shouldn't be right in the middle because they're not going to capture many voters. Fred's still in the middle. That's still the median. The median is the middle of the line. Fred's still here along with a few friends, but um, most of his buddies have moved either left or right. Um, and so we're going to get parties that move left and right in order to try to win. They're going to uh, make their positions more extreme. And what that's going to lead to is gridlock in a legislature, meaning that it's really hard to pass legislation because neither party is compromising enough to get a legislative majority to pass legislation, which I think many of us can see is happening today in the United States. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you to that logic of Anthony Downs and this idea that catch-all parties are not ideological parties the way a communist party or a Nazi party would be. They're perfectly willing to moderate or, um, or extremify, if that's even a word, uh, their positions in order to win an election. So rational choice um, is, is a very simplified model, and it's certainly not the only thing that leads to what a party system looks like in a country. So a political party system in a country is um, basically what this definition says, the set of all the parties in the country, their interactions with each other, and the electoral system and voter loyalties that, that sort of produce those interactions. So we're going to look a little bit at party systems because that's a really important part of um, comparative politics. So in order to understand party systems, we're, we're going to go back to last week's work when we talked about Duverger's law. And um, to be able to understand that the type of electoral system a country has is, is one of the main things that influences a party system. It's not the only thing, but it is one of the main things. So we know that the type of electoral system is going to influence how many parties a country has. Um, but there are other things that, that influence it, like political culture or historical events. Um, and then also the rational behavior, like we just talked about, of parties um, and their voters. So let's take a look at what kinds of party systems we've got in the United States. Uh, so there, really, there's four types. Um, and remember, you know, we in comparative politics, we love to put things in categories, but um, like everything else we've studied this year in terms of categories, these are ideal categories. And you know, you may have a hard time classifying certain countries that you know a lot about and saying well gosh which category does its party system fall into and that's pretty typical so but let's look at these as ideal character uh, types um, so the last one we're going to look at and my my animations are in the wrong order here but the last one we're going to look at is called a single party dominant system and that one kind of stands out as being different uh, from the others um, the first system that is clearly follows Duverger's law um, is the two-party dominant system. And this happens in single member district winner take all elections with a presidential system. And so this is, uh, we'll look at some examples of this in a minute. Uh, the second type is, is a two and a half party system. In other words, there's two major parties and at least one kind of minor party that can play a role in politics. And this happens in um, single member district uh, systems that have parliamentary government, because remember, parliamentary government gives um, the opportunity for those smaller parties to influence government by being part of a governing coalition. 
And then finally, we have the multi-party system, which is more likely in a place where you have uh, proportional representation elections and either a parliament or a semi-presidential system. Um, so these are the ideal types. And then, of course, we have a single party dominant system. Um, and that is an unusual system that doesn't necessarily follow Duverger's law. Um, it's probably pretty easy to see why an authoritarian system uh, would end up with only one political party, uh, but it's harder to tell why a democracy uh, might have might turn out to be single party dominant. So we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, so let's look at some examples of these types of party systems. So the two party and two and a half party dominant systems, remember these are all gonna happen in a place where there are single member district winner take all elections. And these, these countries that I'm using as examples all basically follow Duverger's law. Um, India and the United Kingdom have a parliamentary system. Um, and of course the United States has a presidential system, but these countries all have single member district elections. Um, and so in the United States, we've got the Republican and Democratic parties. In the UK, the Conservative and Labour parties, which have been the main parties uh, pretty much as long as, uh, well, at least since after World War II. Um, in the UK, because it is a parliamentary system, there is, and there's also some geographical strength of some of the smaller parties. A party like today, the Scottish National Party can have um, an influence and be part of government. Um, in the past, we've had the Liberal Democratic Party has been um, in, in the UK has been a, a common coalition partner. Um, it's uh, unlike what it sounds like. It's not a liberal party. It's actually a right in the middle moderate party. And so it's been a coalition partner a lot. Um, India was actually a single party dominant for a very long time from its first free elections in 1952 until the mid 1990s when it really turned into a, a true two party state the way that it is today. So multi party states are, are very common. Again, they're most common in places when um, where we have a um, we have a proportional representation. Um, so we looked at Germany last in our last unit. We looked at the results of their elections and how they have multiple parties. Brazil is very similar to Germany in its multiple party um, coalition based governments. Here, the conflict in society is mostly going to happen or the, the, the political conflict is mostly going to happen between parties. The, the more parties you have, the more conflict is is sort of based between parties. The fewer parties you have, the more that conflict, political conflict happens within a party. Um, so uh, Italy is kind of a cautionary tale. The reason I put that in there is because Italy has a very extreme form of proportional representation, which means it doesn't take a high percentage of votes in order to for a party to win some seats in the legislature. And when you have that, um, it can lead to an extremely unstable government situation where coalitions are always forming and falling and then there's no confidence in the government and you have to have a more election. So um, Italy has had an enormous number of, uh, of governments over the years um, because they tend to, they're, they're, they have so many parties that have some small amounts of political power that they tend to have very unstable coalitions and that makes it difficult. So, so proportional representation and Multi-party systems are, have a lot of pros to them, but they also um, have some weaknesses. So finally, we come to the very interesting situation of single party dominant systems. And here, um, this is a system where the dominant parties, the single party always wins election and basically has no real party competition. There may be other parties, but they'd never win. Um, and as I mentioned before, it, it's easy to think of a system like this in an authoritarian state like China, where, you know, basically the government is the party and um, and the authoritarian government can control elections and um, refuse to allow any electoral competition. Russia, too, is, is becoming a single party dominant authoritarian state. And part of that is because 
uh, Putin and the communists or the United Russia Party, sorry, um, have managed to to really uh, get rid of all of the true party competition. Yes, there are quote unquote rival parties in Russia, but they're all controlled by Putin essentially. Um, so it's it's sort of easy to understand, I think, how we could get a single party in an authoritarian state. But what's interesting and, and probably seems sort of counterintuitive is that it's actually relatively common to have a single party dominant system in a democracy. Um, so Japan is a, is a very good example of a free um, democratic state that has uh, that has one party, which always wins, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party. It's neither, it's not liberal. Um, it's really a slightly right of center. Um, there is a rival party called the Democratic Party of Japan, but it rarely wins. It did have uh, a little bit of electoral success in the kind of mid-2000, mid that, that first decade of the 2000s. But, um, and sometimes people said, oh gosh, Japan's turning into a two-party system. Um, but the LDP came back and, and seems to have really cemented its, its hold on power. Um, Mexico before, in the 20th century, before the turn of the century was also single party dominant um, with the, with the pre-party. Um, and they happen in a democracy when the dominant party sort of basically co-opts all of the interests, the important interests and conflicts in a country inside of itself. So it's not that there's no political conflict or competition in a party like that. It is that the conflict happens within the party amongst its wings and factions. Um, and the parties tend to be really good at smoothing over um, long-term cleavages in society, things like labor versus business. Um, so both the LDP in Japan and the PRI in Mexico before the turn of the century um, really were able to represent both workers and corporations um, and sort of smooth over those cleavages so that a workers party doesn't develop that is a rival to this huge large party. Um, and so often these parties are run on um, something called patronage and clientelism. So clientelism, there's more about that in your book, but it means that basically the party is an organizing institution in societies and that's how it gets its power is that even down to the very local level, especially in a small town, the local politicians um, have favors and rewards to give out to voters in exchange for loyalty, that loyalty to the party. So things like um, government jobs or uh, you know positions in labor unions or things like that. Those are rewards that politicians can give to families and families develop a sort of clan-like um, adherence to a party and that's called clientelistic. It's like you give me something, I'll give you something. It's also called patronage. Uh, the patron is considered to be almost a father-like figure who the patron in Mexico who give, that's not just a name for tequila by the way, that's a, that, that comes from this idea that a strong man in a local area uh, will act almost in a father-like way to families there and develop, they will develop loyalty to that person because of the goodies that they can give out essentially. And that cements this party loyalty. Um, America all actually had these kind of parties at the local level in the late 1800s when um, we had the big party machines in places like Chicago and New York, uh, where the political party not only dominates the political life of a town, but but actually blends into the social life and family life of, of um, towns and cities as well. And that's how single party dominant systems um, maintain their power often is through nepotism and things like that. So that's the end of our video lecture on political parties and party systems. This is the first of two videos, so be sure to view the second one, which is on pluralism versus corporatism, before you post in the discussion board. And I think once you've heard the corporatism lecture, and we'll talk a little bit more about Mexico there, you'll see some, some interweaving of um, kind of interest groups and political parties and how they affect each other and affect the systems. So be sure you view both of them before you post in the discussion board and um, I will see you next time. Bye bye.